So it's about time to kick off the keynote. I'm Carl, I'm your publication chair and the chair of this session. So it's a great pleasure um, inviting Professor David Zhao from Singapore University of Technology Design, where he's a professor of the uh, technology, information technology design together uh, with a PhD from the University of Texas, Austin. So um, this title is Growing Edge ICT Intelligence in Power Grids, Security Challenge and Opportunities. So please join me in welcoming Professor Zhao. Great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share some ideas and results in my uh, recent and also uh, current research. So I'm going to speak on the topic growth at ICT intelligence and how it uh, mainly take the security perspective in terms of both challenge and opportunity. And uh, this is joint work with um, uh, my collaborators. Who is now a PhD student at UIUC. Uh, Yang Li and Sri, they are researchers at PDC. Kimmer is my PhD student at SUTP, and Bertie Khan is now an assistant professor at Okay, so the internet, as we all know, has a well-known so-called hourglass design, and tiny waves and so on. So if that's the case, then I tend to think of the conventional power grid as like the opposite. So it can be something uh, that's actually heavy around the waist, heavy in the middle. And by that, I mean that the complexity and intelligence the main control points, they're mostly the core of the network. The homes and the appliances that connect to the grid, uh, they mostly draw power from it, but uh, otherwise they don't interact with it much because they're not equipped to do so. But in the future, as we have smart homes, smart factories, smart appliances, and so on, then they have, they can have sensing capabilities, they, are, they have situation awareness, they can communicate with the grid using some form of control protocol and so on so forth. Uh, so the um, uh, plug-in node can become you know, a lot more important. So the edge is definitely growing stronger in the total equation. So there are some benefits of a stronger edge. The first one is we can more easily uh, encompass distributed generation. Yeah, the generation sources are usually clean, renewables, like solar, wind, and so on. So they contribute to the uh, sustainability and also environmental friendliness of the system. Then from a safety point of view, if the conventional grid is overloaded, then some breaker in the core of it will open. Uh, this will force the disconnection of some of the users. Uh, of course, that restores the balance between supply and demand. But the disconnected users, they will experience a blackout. They cannot get anything done. Uh, so that's not uh, ideal. But in the future, we may have a lot of the smart appliances run a collaborative protocol, low containment protocol. So that they can take turns, agree to take turns, and everyone use just uh, a fraction uh, less, maybe 10 percent less. So here, the edge intelligence by uh, allowing people to share the pain. So no single users, no single homes have to bear the full force of a, of a blackout. So that can be an improvement in terms of the, of the user satisfaction and the, their happiness. Uh, but a stronger edge can be less safe, and there are many different reasons. The first one is just the presence of the ICT component. That increases the attack service and that opens up a lot of uh, opportunities for new attacks, uh, things that have already happened, DDoS, subnet worms, and so on. So the uh, cyber attacks, right, compared with the V2 ones, uh, they can be a lot more damaging simply because they spread very quickly and they also spread far. Uh, second observation is uh, maybe even more fundamental the, uh, the trust assumption at the edge of the network is a lot weaker than inside the core. And there can be, again, many different reasons for it. Maybe limited user commitment. They are uh, mostly unreliable, not industry-grade devices that are operated or run by non-professionals, sometimes just like you and me. Uh, there's no physical security, so it's, uh, uh, they can be, in general, exposed to uh, many different types of attacks and so on. So cyber attacks on, on power grids or smart grids, of course, is not just a concern, but it's actually uh, quite uh, are feasible and also it's happening. For example, in the Black Hat demo, the hackers community 2009, they used a worm to control a large number of smart meters within just uh, uh, the span of one day. And then in the real world, uh, uh, this is well publicized attack, 2015 Ukrainian grid attack. The attackers breached the VPN as opposed to secure the power network, and then they got insider access, and then they opened some breaker, turned off the generator, 
there were a few hours of black hour and so on and so forth. And more generally, the US Department of Homeland Security, they have estimated that about 40% of attacks on critical infrastructures actually uh, target uh, uh, power grids. So it's interesting to then look at the growth of the critical infrastructures towards the edge of the network from a security perspective. So I will start with a challenge, uh, and then uh, it's about the stability problem of grid real-time pricing under a delay attack. So we start with that, and then later on we'll follow up with uh, what we could do about the situation also. Uh, Real-time pricing, of course, is not a new idea, right? We use it for stock market. So when we trade stocks, uh, we use the latest information, latest prices, uh, market sentiment, and so on. Uh, in the case of uh, electricity pricing, we used to do something called day ahead pricing. So in this case, the Gentiles bid today to determine tomorrow's prices. Uh, but in the future, if we have smart meters, right, so these guys can, uh, can report usage in real time, they can also react to real time prices in real time, so that we can use a demand response uh, to affect the electricity usage in a much more uh, updated manner. For example, every half hour or even more frequently. So RTP first happened for wholesale market. Uh, for example, here in Singapore for a long time, our utility company called Sing Power, basically they can, they can pick from six or seven large gentles to source their energy from. Uh, so that's a wholesale market that has been around for a long time. Then it was introduced for the large customers. These are like factories and supermarkets and so on. So in the US, certain markets, uh, they have been again happening for years. In Singapore, we also have it, I think, recently. Um, large customers are easy to deal with in the sense they have a lot larger demand response capacity and it's also much easier to regulate these customers. Uh, but the trend definitely is to bring it all the way to the regular people. Again, people like you and me, our homes and then maybe the offices and so on and so forth. But as I said, again, the uh, infrastructure for the mass re retail market is not secure in general. So it's prone to attacks and uh, bad things could happen. In fact, that's why maybe Singapore is delaying introducing demand response to the mass retail market right now, because the security concern could be a problem. Uh, so we look at just one specific problem. So we ask the question about uh, the stability of the, of the power grid, of, of, of the real time pricing. Can attackers destabilize the pricing system? Now, stability is a fundamental concern for demand response, because essentially it's a closed loop feedback control system. So for example, if the utility uh, uh, reduces the price, this will encourage the customers use, to use more, uh, and then the demand will increase, then the increased demand will in turn motivate the uh, operator of the utility to now raise the price. So this is a recursive process. So understanding the recursion and the possible malicious action by uh, bad people can be a challenging problem. So we make use of uh, basic supply and demand models, just for illustration. Uh, this is the supply side. Uh, lambda is the real-time price. SI of lambda is the amount of electricity that generator I is willing to produce at that price. So uh, intuitively, we expect it to be an increasing function, because if the price is higher, you can sell the electricity at high profits. That would encourage you to produce more. Now this increasing nature is observed in, in the real world as well. So this is data taken from the Australian energy market operator. Then the total supply of the system is simply the sum of all the supplies by the, the, diff, the different uh, gentles. Uh, demand is similar, but in fact demand has two parts. The first one is the elastic part. Uh, this is the part that does respond to the price. So this is the, uh, if the price is lambda, then this customer I would like to use EI lambda of electricity. So a nice supplier does we expect this to be a decreasing function. So uh, maybe uh, uh, this region essentially is just the, the users of price elastic, essentially. So for example, on a hot day, right, if the electricity price is high, then I might set my AC uh, temperature setting to be less than optimal comfort, because that would stop, save me some money, things like that. Now, but for demand, we actually also have a second part. This is the baseline demand. Uh, this part is, is inelastic. Our example would be like uh, at home, right? Maybe we have to cook dinner at 6 p.m. because the kids are hungry. We just do it irrespective of how much the gas costs at that time. And then in industry users can also be uh, quite inelastic because they may have to operate a production pipeline 
because they are delivery deadlines that they need to meet. Uh, so although this plant does not react to the price, but it is not a static quantity. In fact, it can be highly dynamic depending on a lot of factors, like whether you know different activities at different times of day, weekdays versus versus weekends, any special events like World Cup final happening and things like that. But in general, the utility companies uh, have a pretty good way of predicting this baseline demand, simply because usually there is a lot of historical data available to support the regression that we do the prediction. Uh, this is an illustration of the unstable pricing problem. Uh, this is the demand curve, so this is the decreasing function. This is the supply curve, the increasing function. Now where the two curves interact is called the market clearing price. At this point, things are believed to be economically efficient in the sense that all demand is met and all supply is also taken up. There's no surplus in the system. Uh, but because of errors or uh, attacks by bad people, we can be off from the uh, clearing price. Initially, we may just be a little bit off. Okay? But based on the actual demand, the supply will recalculate the price. The customer will do the same thing. Then we have a scheduling error, which is the difference between the scheduled supply and the actual demand. Now, of course, importantly, this process doesn't stop here. It goes on and on. Okay, so in this case, uh, actually, the scheduling error keeps increasing, and the prices oscillate, and also they diverge. Diverging prices is just a number. What's, what's the big deal, right? But in fact, it can have quite uh, bad fiscal de effects. And some examples would be the power network can become overloaded. We're no longer at uh, market efficiency, so the operation cost can be higher than necessary. We can have frequency excursion. Uh, the actual frequency of the grid may deviate from the uh, from the uh, 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 the standard. For example, 50 hertz or 60 hertz, and so on. If this happens uh, for a prolonged amount of time, then equipment damage uh, can result. For example, generators can become damaged. So the stability problem can be quite critical from that point of view because we do have uh, uh, severe fiscal effects on the system. Uh, so we make use of a control theoretic model to, an to understand and analyze this problem. Uh, the basic idea is actually quite simple. Uh, we adjust the price based on the scheduling error. And as I said, it's just the difference between the schedule supply and the actual demand. So in this block diagram, given the scheduling error, the pricing algorithm will update the price. This will cause the elastic consumers and the suppliers to re-optimize the decisions. The baseline demand adds to the total demand, but because it does not uh, react to the price signal, so basically we just moderate its noise in the system. Uh, the different ways to do the pricing, this is a particularly simple way, again, just for illustration. So here we use the, um, uh, uh, when we predict the price for the K time slot, we use the price for the previous time slot only. Okay, now in general, we could use a much longer history and so on and so forth, but um, uh, this will work. And as I said, it's uh, uh, based on the scheduling error, and it's actually proportional to it. Now, in the proportionality constant, this is in fact a, uh, uh, an interesting physical parameter. This eta value uh, basically is a, is a parameter that is set by the operator in the real-time pricing algorithm, and this physical function is to, is to allow the operator to react to un unexpected changes in the baseline. Okay, so uh, because we might mispredict the baseline and so on, right? So to have maximum robustness in reacting or tracking this changing uh, baseline, we would like to be able to choose the eta parameter, the gain, uh, within the full range of zero to one. That's essentially the uh, importance of this parameter. Uh, then we consider two types of attacks. The first one is a scaling attack, actually the second one here. Uh, it means you corrupt the price signals. Okay, so uh, uh, I mean it's the obvious thing to do, right? Like the price is two dollars, you make it appear like three dollars, and so on. But in the interest of time, I'll skip this part in my in my talk now. Uh, instead, I'll look at the first type. This is called a delay attack. It's actually even more simple than this one. You don't have to corrupt the prices; you just delay them. Okay, so that uh, the operator, for example, in making the current decision, it will be making use of an outdated price to do so. Okay, so we uh, use two parameters to characterize the attack. The first one is the graph of it. It's uh, characterized by the parameter rho. This is the fraction of the, of the smart meters or the homes that are under attack. So for example, if you have a million homes and then you delay the price signals to like 100,000 of them, 
then the uh, row will be equal to 10 percent. So that's the meaning. That's why it's the correct. How extensive, how spread out the attack is. The other is the depth of the attack is characterized by the parameter tau. This is simply the amount of the malicious delay. So it can be half an hour, one hour, or several hours, and so on. Um, now the delay attack is interesting because uh, it could happen in practice. And the reason why it can happen is because the existing clock synchronization algorithms, they're not completely trustworthy. Uh, for example, utilities may distribute GPS time to its devices, but recent results show that uh, you can actually spoof the GPS signal. In our community, we're familiar with NTP, right? We might use a, uh, the NTP protocol. But NTP, of course, itself has a lot of vulnerabilities. A particularly simple, the powerful one, is in fact for the attacker just to delay one direction of the, of, of the packets being sent. Okay. Now, the attacker could delay both directions, but, but if, if he does so, the effects will cancel out. So to achieve the maximum impact, it would just delay uh, uh, one direction of the synchronization. And if it does so, then the clock uh, will become off-sync due to this, this attack by half the amount of the malicious delay. So in our lab environment, we just verify the feasibility that uh, uh, this attack works against actual implementation of NTP. So we picked an, uh, a distribution of NTP. Now these are uh, uh, implementations may have safeguard against you know sudden changes of delay and so on. Okay, but uh, in that case, if the attacker is, is smart, then what he can do is not to abruptly change the delay, but to gradually change it. For example, gradually increase it. Then the effect would be uh, uh, every delay would not be so big, so it would stay under the radar. It will not be detected by the detection algorithm, but the accumulated delay can be quite big, for example, up to seconds and so on. So uh, here are some results about the region of stability. So we characterize it in terms of the range of eta because of its importance. Uh, so a smaller region of stability, meaning that we have more restricted choices for eta, and then the indication record is that uh, it would not limit the, uh, the robustness of the system to track and also accommodate unexpected changes in the, in the baseline because the baseline is dynamic. So these are some of our results. Uh, the are individual results from the control theoretic analysis. So here, uh, the x-axis is the delay, the amount of the delicious delay. The y is the range of the, uh, of the eta value. So when things are stable, we characterize the region in green. Our main result is that if you, if you compromise less than half of the customers, okay, then there is no concern for instability. The system will remain uh, stable. So for example, if row is equal to 50%, then everything is green here. But as soon as you, you exceed that, for example, just 51% of the uh, meters under the attack, then things can become unstable. We will have an unstable region. How bad this is, how more restricted ETA becomes, it depends on the malicious delay. So obviously if the malicious delay is, is larger, is stronger, then ETA becomes uh, uh, more restricted. Okay, so in the limiting case, if you compromise all the smart meters, row is equal to 100%, then the unstable region can dominate the stable region. Uh, so the lesson here is uh, uh, basically, you know, how can I achieve if I have a million homes, for example, okay, compromising 50% of them requires me to compromise 500,000 homes, or 500,000 smart meters. So how can I do it feasibly in practice? So our, 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 maybe it's most likely for the attacker to achieve a high enough row by attacking the time synchronization infrastructure. For example, if you use NTP, I'll attack the NTP servers. And because all of us depend on it, right, then maybe many meters can be affected by this attack and therefore achieve the necessary breadth of it. Uh, so we also did simulations to understand the physical impact of, of this kind of attack. We use a grid lab D uh, simulator. It's publicly available, in fact, and is uh, 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 quite popular in terms of, of simulating distribution networks. So we use it, we model, we use a setting uh, of about 1,400 customers. We random, se randomly select row fraction of it to be subject to the delay attack. Uh, these are the results. This is the plot for the real-time price. Uh, so basically, the real-time price uh, oscillate, but the oscillations are very small. Uh, the reason it oscillates is because it's a naturally dynamic system. Right? So it's not, uh, for example, the baseline amounts keep changing. 
but the oscillations are small, and then the real time price mostly success successfully track the market clearing price. In terms of the load, things also look normal, no, no specific concerns. But once we launch an attack, for example, we launch a delay attack at time step number one here, then afterwards the prices will, be, will begin to oscillate and also uh, fluctuate. In terms of physical impact, then grid D, the simulator reports an emergency event 20 hours after the start of the attack. And the attack can also become quite severely overloaded. It's actually more than 200%. Now, this is a strong attack in the sense that all the smart meters are compromised. So row was equal to 100%, and the malicious delay was 4.5 hours. Uh, this is a weaker attack, 65% meters compromised. The effects are more subdued, but the nature of it is actually similar to the previous case. So uh, after launch of attack, you see the price oscillation. We do see emergency events, although happening uh, later, and it's still significant overload, 25% in this case. So that was the security problem when we have real-time intelligence at the edge. Okay, for our, our basically we use the ICT control, right, to to make the smart meters respond to the price signal. So there can be a significant problem in stability of the system. And then the lesson we learn is that uh, attackers may be most likely to succeed in this attack by compromising the time synchronization infrastructure. So the third question is, right, how do we, how do we uh, secure the time synchronization infrastructure? And then can we likewise use a physical property of the power grid to do so? So this is the second part of this talk about the, the opportunity when we adopt a CPS approach in the networking. So it's a new cyber digital system approach for trustworthy clock synchronization. Uh, specifically, we make use of the electrical network frequency of the AC grid, because the AC grid, the, the, vo the voltage is oscillating. And then we use it as a global signal for this clock synchronization. So this method is a departure, for example, from uh, NTP, PTP, and also many variants of, of similar protocols uh, that people have, have, have uh, proposed for wireless sensor networks in the sense that all those protocols are based on message passing, okay? And so they have, they have messages that can be delayed. That's why they're subject to the delay attack. In this approach, I don't send any packets. Okay? At, least, at least my basic information does not depend on, on the packets themselves. Now, importantly, from the security point of view, this grid signal is a trustworthy signal. By that, I mean if, if the attacker tries to high frequency disturbances into the system, then these disturbances can be easily removed by a low pass filter. Now on the hand, if it tries to do this the opposite, inject low frequency disturbances into it, then it would require a tremendous amount of energy for him to be successful. So it uh, becomes practical, impractical for the attacker, both in terms of economics and also the logistics. So we did experiments to understand the empirical properties of the power grid frequency. We did experiments at three locations in Singapore. Uh, so this is the whole country, right? It's, a, it's essentially just a city, and these are the three locations. Uh, they are quite far apart, and these are not, it's a, in, a, in kind of a wide area setting, so it's about 30 kilometers between A and B. Uh, first property we notice is that it's just a phase in the voltage signals. And then this, this phase difference essentially in, increases, roughly speaking, as the distance increases. For example, the profiles for two nodes that are close together, like on the same building, uh, you don't notice the phase shift at all. They're just overlapping. But for 30 kilo kilometers apart, in this case, then one signal clearly lacks the other, and then the phase shift becomes uh, noticeable. Uh, but our second observation is that although we cannot ignore the phase difference, it's not a negligible quantity, but it's, uh, on the one hand, it's quite small. For example, in the 30 km case, uh, you probably can't read it, at least, uh, uh, especially in the back, but these are like a few milliseconds, two point something milliseconds. And then uh, for the 15 km case, it's actually sub millisecond, it's about uh, 0.3 milliseconds, and so on. So the phase difference is small. Now, equally importantly, it's also a stable uh, phenomenon. For example, the standard deviation of the two profiles, they are quite small, just a few microseconds. Uh, this is interesting because this, this will allow us to, for a, for a certain deployment, in the beginning, we can do calibration to understand the space difference so that later on we can remove its effects. Now, obviously, if we don't do that, then the phase difference will add to the synchronization error. 
right? in which case the result shows that uh, it can add up to a few milliseconds in the, in the synchronization. Uh, this is the second key, pro key property, right? The context here is that uh, all AC grids are regulated at a nominal frequency. Uh, for example, in, in Asia, like Singapore and uh, China, for example, uh, the frequency would be 50 hertz. In North America, uh, USA, Canada, it would be 60 kilohertz. But although it's regulated as a fixed frequency, the actual frequency is not fixed because of, of constantly changing instantaneous supply <coughs> and demand that allows you, that need, requires you to react. Uh, so for example, in these two frequency profiles, observed at two locations, green and blue, uh, the frequency can go up to 50.15 hertz and down to 49.95 hertz. Okay, so you have these tiny fluctuations around the nominal value. Now, what, what is important is that uh, if you use a time sequence of these minute fluctuations, then you may get a unique signal, uh, a time signature that's indicative of time. So we call this thing the time fingerprint. Okay, so it's a sequence of the of these sub fluctuations, small fluctuations over some period of time. Now, equally importantly, the fluctuations of the two locations they are in the same. They go hand in hand. For example, when the green goes up, the blue goes up. The um, uh, when the green goes down, the blue also goes down. Although they are two locations, 30 km apart. So what that means is not only do we have a fingerprint, but we have a global fingerprint that can be matched across different locations. So that gives a basis of cross synchronization. For our purpose, we measure the voltage profile for the AC grid at the location, and the time fingerprint is a sequence of the of the fluctuating time periods of, of this uh, sinus, sinusoid. Okay, so but the same idea as the fluctuating the fluctuating frequencies, where instead of around 50 hertz for Singapore, it would be around 20 milliseconds. Okay, but it's also fluctuating, and they're also in sync at different locations. So we have three ways to exploit this, this uh, ENF as the time fingerprint. The first one is just to use a time fingerprint as it is defined. So it's a detailed time fingerprint. So this is an accurate approach, but we have to design <coughs> specialized sensing hardware to do it. Uh, the second approach is uh, we try not to use too much specialized hardware. So we ask the question, can I use just uh, off the shelf PC hardware to do it, specifically a sound card. So in this case, we cannot get the full time fingerprint, but we can get a succinct representation of it. Meaning that uh, if you're interested in the event time, you can measure this time as the offset of the time from the last beginning AC cycle of the grid. Okay, so we call this protocol GTP. This is a grid time protocol as a contrast to network time protocol. Uh, these two approaches require that you plug in the synchronization devices. Okay, so uh, they're important devices, but sometimes, of course, we still want to, to consider the untapped devices. So in the third approach, we ask the question, can we extract the, um, uh, the time fingerprint from a wireless EMF signal? And then the yeah, wireless EMF, EMF signal exists because of electromagnetic radiation. So electricity flows on wire, basically it would induce EMR, electromagnetic radiation. So we also try to um, uh, encompass the, the wireless devices. Uh, so this is the special hardware that we designed for approach one. Uh, the essential thing is that uh, because we're interested in the T, the time period, so the, uh, the quantity that will give us this idea is when does the signal uh, cross the zero point. Okay, so to facilitate the identification, we just convert the sinusoid into a square signal that makes this crossing more pronounced. Now you can use the time fingerprint for synchronization. The way you do it is uh, 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 so the IoT slave is a slave of a synchronization session. It will send its local clock value, but not just that, but also the time fingerprint that it records locally at that time instant. So we send it to the master. The master locally will also record its time fingerprints, but then uh, for a long period in fact. So there will be a database of the time fingerprints. The master will match the slave time fingerprint with its own database, finds the best offset, let's say it's minus five, and then it will send back to the slave, then the slave will adjust the clock. So this is the basic approach. Uh, this is some more detail about the decoding. So this is the green thing is the time fingerprint of the slave. Blue is the longer database uh, recorded locally by the master. So what the master will do is uh, it will compute the similarity. You can use RMSE measure or, or similar measures like that. 
uh, you compute the similarity at offset i, then you get a value of s i. Uh, and you do the same thing for i plus 1, i plus 2, and so on and so forth. Then the best offset, the matching result that you declare, is the offset that maximizes all these uh, similarity values. So you use it as the output of your algorithm. Uh, so we, we <coughs> characterize the performance of this uh, uh, decoding. So uh, the performance is in terms of the probability of correct decoding. And uh, we use GPS time as the ground truth in, the, in, in knowing whether we are correct or not. Uh, these are results for the um, uh, an, an office setting. Okay, so all these test points are shown here on the same floor of the office. Now it's customary, basically, the electrical network of a room or you know building like this will have three phases. So they indicated as red, blue, and also yellow. Okay, so the different devices plugged in, depending on the socket you chose, will be plugged into one of these phases. So our main result is that uh, if they are connected to the same phase, if the slave and the master connected to the same phase, which correspond to the results here, then you achieve probability one decoding even when the, thing, the time fingerprint line is quite small. For example, just a, a couple of hundreds of samples will be sufficient for that. On the other hand, if they are connected to different phases, um, uh, then the decoding becomes a lot more challenging. So the, the decoding result is uh, not very good. So even here is 0 0.7. Although it does increase when you increase the length of, of the time fingerprint. So, so using the same phase is really important for this. Uh, these are results for, or for nodes that save masters on different floors but of the same building. Okay, so in this case are, are similar. Uh, if we have both the, the slave and the master connected to the red phase, which is shown here, then when the time fingerprint becomes long enough, we achieve a probability of one successful decoding. How long does it have to be? Maybe uh, uh, about a thousand something samples compared with just uh, you know, uh, the tens of samples in the earlier case. For city scale deployment, similar trend. Uh, the, all these are for, for, for slaves master connected to the same phase. So for example, both of them the red, both of them the blue, both of them the yellow. They all eventually go to probability one, but in this case, the time fingerprint has to be even longer, maybe uh, uh, close to 10,000 samples for, for we to be uh, always successful. But the still is doable, that means even over the wide area. We also measure the synchronism, that's the phase difference, T1 minus T2, between the two sinusoids at their two different locations. We can did it for the same three settings, uh, two nodes on the same floor, different floor, same building, different buildings. Uh, the main result is even for the most challenging case, which is the third row here, the uh, phase difference, the mean is 156 microseconds, and the standard deviation is, is 17. So again, that means, uh, at least according to these experiments, right, that even if you do not do the calibration of the phase shift in the beginning, you can achieve some millisecond accuracy uh, in the wide area. Uh, these are just results over a longer period of time, uh, days, and then the days encompass quite different low profiles. For example, some days are weekend, some days are weekdays, and then also daytime, nighttime, and so on. Okay, so but in spite of all the dynamics, essentially the profile, the mean uh, for this one is 5.8 microseconds if they're close. Uh, if they're 15 kilometers apart, 132 microseconds, the SD is small. Okay, so that gives us a reassurance that uh, the phase shift is, is although it's present, but it's, it's quite manageable in practice. Uh, then we can achieve security against the packet delay attack. This is a more detailed illustration. So the slave, remember, will record the time fingerprint, but let's, let's say it's of length n. Okay, then it will send it to the master. Uh, for successful decoding, the master needs to make sure that this fingerprint does occur within its own trace, within its own uh, database. So to make sure that this will happen, the uh, master would make use of much longer database, for example, of length L samples, where L is a lot longer than the, uh, the period of the, of the AC grid. For 50 hertz, essentially, the period is 20 milliseconds. So we use a long enough database for the decoding. Then, like before, you compute the best offset, send it back to the slave. Now, in principle, an attacker can delay the time fingerprint so much, right, because this is, this is done, the sending is done by message passing. So the uh, attacker can delay this so much that uh, the time fingerprint will fall off the master database. 
Or in this case, the society would do a sanity check. If it, it assesses that this situation is happening, then it will reject the synchronization result and will notify the master that some exceptional event uh, has happened. Now, importantly, because the information that we use in this process measures the uh, single trip delay, either from slave to master or from master to slave, separately and also explicitly. So it is not subject to the so-called symmetric link assumption of the message ba passing based protocols like MTP, PDP, and a whole family of it. Okay, so because of that, then this approach is not vulnerable to the to the packet delay attack because the attack can no longer break, just, just delay one way of the direction uh, of the transfer to break the symmetric link assumption. Uh, second approach, uh, the main idea is just to, uh, instead of using that carefully designed hardware, and we use off-the-shelf PC hardware to do the sensing, because obviously because this hardware is uh, just available already. Uh, so we try it out with the PC sound card. Uh, the basic idea is the PC sound card already allows you to do sampling as 44 kilohertz. Now it turns out to be not quite enough full resolution for full time fingerprint, but uh, uh, it would capture, it would allow a succinct representation of it. Okay, so again, that succinct representation is the offset of the event time from the beginning of the last AC cycle. In, in the interest of time, I would not go into the details, but if you're interested, of course, I'll be happy to talk with you afterwards. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, using this approach, we can achieve some millisecond uh, uh, synchronization accuracy, even in a wide area network, for example, 15, 30 kilometers. The caveat is that uh, this synchronization is subject to a so-called GTP condition. Okay, meaning for unambiguous decoding, we require the RTT, the round trip time of a time synchronization session, to be less than twice the period of the grid signal. Okay, so because the grid signal is 20 milliseconds, the period. So twice that means uh, you have to complete the whole synchronization within, within 40 milliseconds. Okay, then in that case, even if you don't have the total fully accurate information, uh, there's still no ambiguity. So uh, again, I won't need to go into detail, but just present an experiment of, uh, at least in Singapore, how likely are we to achieve that GTP condition. So we did uh, experiments, we ran a lot of synchronization sessions uh, in different settings. The most challenging maybe this one, so it's a WAN setting with natural traffic, and also deliberately introduced quite severe uh, congestion, a natural congestion into it. The main observation is that uh, because of this congestion, that the mean time of the RTT can go about 40 milliseconds. Okay, so it's not always achieved, the GP condition. However, we do not need it to be always achieved because you just have to uh, maintain the, the clock synchronization. Right? So you only have to, to achieve this, this condition frequently enough for you to maintain the synchronization. Now, important property of GTP is unlike NTP, for example, if you have a successful synchronization, meaning that uh, the RTT is indeed less than 40 milliseconds, then you know that the result is accurate and also trustworthy. Okay, so then, uh, so if you're only occasionally success, uh, su successful, you just you just pick the result, the times when you are successful. Okay, so that's the, uh, the basic idea. So the first two approaches are good, but they work only for, for directly connected devices. So again, uh, uh, there are many IoT devices that belong to that type. But still, there are mobile devices and so on that we do want to consider. So here, in the third approach, uh, we, we look at how to extract the time fingerprint from the wireless uh, signal, which is again the EMR. Uh, so the main challenge is, of course, that wireless signal is a lot weaker, right? And it can be subject to a lot more interference. So indeed, okay, so the uh, 0 0.1 hertz fluctuation that we measure in the Y line case, which is the red thing here, uh, becomes measured as 4 hertz fluctuation in the wireless case, which is this blue profile. So the question is, uh, obviously, does the EMR still contain time fingerprints that are accurate enough for clock synchronization, for the purpose of clock synchronization? So again, we try to answer the question experimentally. We make use of two types of platforms. The first one is a, is a Raspberry Pi and Alpine. Uh, uh, it's a high-end platform. It's actually our high is like a hundred-dollar computer, right? It's, a, it's a, actually a full PC, but it's a it's a low-capability one. Then we use a dedicated antenna in this more capable platform. The other one is uh, where we use what we use in the wireless sensor network committee. We use a, a Z1 mode, a 
Okay, so in this case, it's, a, it's an even cheaper device, and then we simply use a conductive wire to act as the contain as the antenna. So some illustration of the of the challenge of noise. So there are actually two types of noise. The first one is high frequency noise. So in this case, this is the EMR that we collected. So basically, you can see that it is a sinusoid, right? Although it's a much more jagged and so on because of the noise. But when we zoom into it, for example, this is a zero crossing we're interested in. But when we zoom, zoom into it, then because of the, of the interference in noise, in fact, the signals uh, uh, fluctuate up and down, again, by small quantities, okay? But because of this fluctuation, then you actually have multiple zero crossings. Okay, now this problem can be solved by using a so-called dead zone approach, meaning after detecting the first zero crossing, we enforce a dead zone that will suppress the detection of, of samples that occur too soon afterwards. Okay, now this works for high frequency noise, but it is not a panacea in the sense that uh, we also have low frequency noise that is uh, illustrated in this case. So in this case, this kind of noise will make this, this uh, period of the sinusoid, uh, it goes up beyond zero, but it barely touches it, okay? So in this case, we do, so we, we do have two zero crossing, one up and one down, okay? Then we do not want the death zone approach to suppress uh, the second one, okay? Because it is, it is uh, somehow inferred to be too close to the first one. So, but uh, uh, basically, it's just high frequency, no, high frequency noise, low frequency noise. So once we understand the origin of the error, then we can apply a, a pass filter to clean up the signal. So the blue is the result of the of the clean signal. And in this case, we can see that the zero crossing detection becomes uh, a lot more robust. Although the challenge is how to realize the band pass filter on a resource constrained device. So this is the uh, the food signal processing pipeline. So we we ran the raw EMF signal through the bandpass filter, becomes 50 hertz EMF. We did the ro more robust zero crossing detection, and we also use a sliding window to compute the average of the frequency. So that turns out to give an even more robustness against uh, noise in the system. Uh, the results are shown here. The red is the ground truth. Uh, the yellow is the result of the signal processing pipeline. Uh, the main takeaway is that the yellow tracks the red quite well. The mean error is about 0 0.7 millihertz. RMSE is about 44 millihertz. So they're small values. Uh, decoding uh, is actually quite similar to the Y line case for approach number one. Uh, so we're given a uh, EM hour fingerprint, a wireless fingerprint, a, a time timestamp from the slave. Uh, we we'll slide it using slide, sliding window approach across the database the blue one recorded at the master. Okay, then we declare the best match within this interval. For example, it should be here. But because of noise from time to time, we can be off. So whereas the true position should be here, but we infer it to be here. Then in that case, the difference between the two, we quantify it as the decoding error. So we measure the performance in some uh, experiments. Uh, the evaluation has five sites. These are heterogeneous sites. The first one is the commercial building. There are two university campuses, SUTD and NTU, and then there are two uh, residential uh, apartments. Uh, so we systematically explore a few parameters like the sampling rate, uh, the length of the wireless timestamp, and whether we did the signal processing on the low end or the high end platform. And again, we use GPS time as the ground truth. So uh, these are some basic results. Uh, so this is the decoding error on the y-axis. So what that tells you is the decoding error becomes uh, higher than the previous two approaches, but could still be in enough accurate enough for some uh, actual application. How big is it? Is in fact that the mean is about a tens of milliseconds. For example, it's about 50 milliseconds in this case. Uh, just like the Y-line case, if you increase the uh, length of the wireless timestamp, you do get better performance. And so there's a, an inherent trade-off between the accuracy, meaning a smaller decoding error, versus the overheads. And the overheads are in terms of both uh, of, of computation, communication, and also the storage that you require to store that database. Uh, results using the five sites that I uh, mentioned. The master is, is found here, so the database is also found here. Uh, the five test sites, uh, one is just at the location of the master, the other farther away. Uh, we report the decoding error for both the high end and the low end one. So this is the, low, the high end one, and then this is the low end one. 
Uh, so this is the how high, this is the low. The, uh, what we observe is the high end, because of high resolution signal processing, high sampling frequency, and so on, we get the coding error that are a few times smaller than the other one, maybe one third of, of the of low end one. However, interestingly, actually, the geographical distance does not seem to matter. Okay, so in, in the, uh, for example, when they are just close together versus they are far apart, the, uh, the order of the errors are uh, quite comparable. And in this case, also unlike the Y-line case, the particular phase doesn't matter, okay, because things are not very accurate anyway. Okay, so then uh, it, whether you connect it to the same phase or different phase doesn't matter a lot. We also did some more <coughs> systematic experiments in the home. The main uh, question we want to ask is, obviously as your EMR sensor gets farther and farther away from the wall uh, power line, then the signal becomes uh, weaker and weaker. So expect the, the uh, error to increase. So indeed, uh, that's what we observe as we move the sensor away from the wall, where the power of course flows here, uh, in some wire inside it, then the error increases. Then over the whole range of the setting, then the smallest is here, 62 milliseconds. The largest, I think, is uh, somewhere here, 348 milliseconds. So again, it's, it's, it's at least from an order magnitude point of view, is consistent with the previous results. We get errors uh, that can be as good as tens of milliseconds, right? But uh, if you in more changing the situation, it can increase. Okay, so we can use time fingerprints essentially for clock synchronization. I've been focusing on that. But in practice, actually, you can also use it for many other applications. And I'll just discuss one of them. I'll give some high level ideas about one of them. So here is instead of doing clock synchronization, we'd like to verify a timestamp that you have collected for an event. Uh, so this is the setting. There's an event that's interesting, so we'd like to know when it happens. Okay, so then you will uh, just locally collect a timestamp by, by sensing your grid at that location, record it. Initially, maybe you don't even have network connectivity, right? Maybe because some failure has occurred and so on. But uh, it doesn't matter because you, all you need is just to measure the, the timestamp locally. Then once the network connectivity is installed, you would like to verify the integrity of this timestamp. So what you can do then at that point, because you now have network connectivity, you send it to the to a database, okay, to uh, for matching, right? Then the, then the, the master node will tell you whether indeed I found this timestamp within my my uh, database. But because this may not be trustworthy or this may not be correct, in fact we have two situations. The first one is the good one, right? Indeed, the timestamp collected at the at the at the sensor node, for example, is indeed within the database. So this is situation one. The other situation is the opposite. The natural timestamp does not occur anyway. Okay, so maybe because it's incorrect. Now our approach to the matching is uh, from the original natural timestamp. We'll again slide the sliding window across it and then generate many subnatural timestamps that are shorter than this one. And then we'll do the offset computation, determine the best offset for every one of these uh, subnatural timestamps. So that's what we do. So we don't get just one result, the best match, but we get a sequence of the best match result. Then there are two possibilities. Okay, the first one, when, when the timestamp indeed occurs within the database, that we expect that the uh, matching results will all concentrate around the actually true clock offset. Okay, so this would be the situation for, uh, for this case. On the other hand, for the other one, because this is not really found anywhere, then the offsets that you computed will be spread out, right? They don't concentrate around uh, around anywhere. So in this case, they concentrate. Not only that, you can do the actual decoding. Here, uh, they are spread out. So that gives us a method to discriminate between the two cases. Uh, we had an implementation of this method on Z1 mode. Then uh, the results show we got 98.5% accuracy. So this is for forensic, maybe, right? That you try to validate the timestamp that's claimed to be recorded some uh, sometime, you know, when this significant event happened, but verify indeed whether this is the case or not. Okay, so just quick summary. Okay, so there are three approaches. The first one is based on the time fingerprint, detailed, right? It requires sensing hardware. It's the most accurate. If it, if they are really uh, close together, we can get errors of accuracy <coughs> on the orders of microseconds. 
The caveat is again, they need to be connected to the same phase. Now I skipped the, all the details here, but uh, just report to you that uh, we also developed a automated procedure for a device connect plug into a socket to automatically find out what phase it is on. So, so, um, uh, so the because it's important to know the phase that we have a procedure for it. For the PGP, the advantage is uh, uh, we can just use off-the-shelf sensing hardware. The caveat is we need to satisfy this GDP condition, which according to our experiments, they, they do satisfy frequently enough for it to be useful. Uh, for the wireless case, uh, they can be wireless, but of course they cannot be just generally wireless, right? So although the devices don't need to be plugged into the grid, they still need to be close to it, okay? And they need, they need to be close to the same grid. Now importantly, uh, from a security point of view, all three approaches are immune to the packet delay. All three approaches are immune to the packet delay attack because, again, we measure the single trip delay explicitly instead of relying on that assumption. These are some applications. If you're interested, I'll be happy to point you to that more to discuss with you. And uh, just in conclusion, so our critical infrastructures are getting smart, but you have the edge. We, we think security implications are important. We use delay attack against the grid to illustrate both the problem. This is the, how you subvert the ICT control to cause instability. The lesson we learned is the time synchronization infrastructure is important. So we have uh, turned the question around, right? So we use the edge ICT sensing to hopefully uh, provide a synchronization infrastructure that is more credible, more trustworthy than what we have now. Okay, so with that, I thank you and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions. So thanks a lot. I will facilitate with the microphone here if we have questions. Anyone? We have like five minutes or so until we need to move over to the next agenda point. There must be questions to this very interesting topic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I have one there. Exercise. Yes, it is. Thank you very much, Professor. Today, Chandra, for me, at Eden Cowan University. Quite a few questions, quite a broad presentation, and many uh, interesting topics. But one thing that really strikes me is it's actually a two edged question. First one is the first part of the question is that you're trying to. Uh, incorporate the proximity-based parameter in the NTP, which will work fine, but wouldn't it actually tie, uh, would cause sort of a domino effect to the critical infrastructure protection? I'm not sure if I understood your question. So you're, you're saying we're adding something to NTP? Uh, the the proximity-based uh, parameter, like uh, the electrical network frequency. Oh, we're using it in place of NTP. We're not adding to it. So instead of using the message passing and then I time the, for example, you send me a packet, right? And then you, the timestamp was T, I receive a T prime. I determine the delay to be T prime as T, but that gives an opportunity for an attacker in the middle to insert an extra delay, right? So that's how NTP works. In that case, we don't rely on it, right? Because, because I just locally measure the grid frequency property, you locally measure it, and then when you send me that uh, signature, I'll just match it. You see, right? So I, that's, from that point of view, that's why I said uh, we don't depend on this uh, uh, delay, you know, measurement at the packet level. So the, 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 the grid the network frequency, if I'm, put me wise, if I'm wrong, if I knew the distance between the point, the point origin and point, you know, at the end, yes. I'll be able to calculate that. You mean in terms of the distance? Yeah, if I knew the distance. Actually, sure you don't need to know the distance. The distance matches in the sense of the of the phase shift, okay. But again, you know, you could you could calibrate in the beginning, correct for the back, or just leave it as part of the synchronization error, okay. But uh, but there's no no dependence on, on on whether we're close together or we're far apart, right? Modulo the fact, of course, if we're close together, the accuracy is a lot better. Thank you very much. Good. We have room for one or two more questions. Yes. Yes. Thank you for the talk. Um, so. Okay. 
So um, you're addressing security exchanges. Um, some people say that in domains like this, there are also a lot of safety measures. And some of the security tags are rather academic because safety will solve this problem anyway. Can you comment on this? Uh, well, I definitely agree. I agree with that. Although between the two, maybe security <coughs> is, a, is more kind of problem, right? Because even if you have a phone that will not naturally occur, you know, the adversary will try to find it. But uh, I tend to think of this 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 grid-based synchronization approach maybe is workable in both situations. Right? For example, actually the forensics time scenario, I, I was not assuming that as an attacker, right? Okay, so but, but still, right? I mean, it allows you to to verify whether a time that we have recorded was correct or not. The challenge is, okay, when you record the time, you do not have network connectivity. Right. So you cannot run NTP to make sure that this is trustworthy. Okay, right. But it doesn't mean that the guy recording time is necessarily uh, you know, an attacker or malicious. He just records the, the, the time to the best of his ability, it makes a local time. But it doesn't matter, right, because uh, although the other, uh, the, the, the base, the master, is not explicitly connected to the slave when the slave records the timestamp, but they are connected to the same grid. Okay. Now, of course, it's not without assumption, right? Obviously, we assume that you know the, 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 the grid was still running, right? We don't have the electricity outage. Okay. But under that assumption, then we can uh, make use of the opportunity to later verify the clock time step. You see, right? Okay. Now, obviously, okay, I don't claim to solve all kinds of safety problems. Okay, but there could be some implications. In Any more questions? We have room for one more. Mm -hmm. If not, then I would ask our general chair to step forward and uh, hand over our sign of appreciation to the keynote speaker.